everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm Dr. Yathar Sachar, Assistant Professor at Manipal Center for European Studies. And uh, we are beginning the second day of this winter school with a session on <coughs> recording the geopolitical construct of the Indo-Pacific. Now today, as we see the map of Asia is being reimagined, uh, the idea of the Asia-Pacific which made good sense as a framework for the regional order in the late 20th century. It is giving way to another construct today, the Indo-Pacific. We are also well aware that words, ideas, and mental images have the power to shape the world in which we live. An imagined space on a map, it reflects both, it reflects and influences real and palpable things, like military deployments, like patterns of prosperity and calculations of risk among world's most powerful states. Today, we see a contest is emerging over how to define Asia conceptually, including choice of terminology. Now, the speed at which the Indo-Pacific thinking or the concept has taken off in recent years has real world consequences for how states and leaders perceive the regional strategic order, the challenges it faces, and the ways to address them. To discuss some of these issues in more detail, today we are delighted to have with us two of our esteemed guests, Professor Harsh Pant and Dr. Gudrun Backer. Dr. Pant is a professor of international relations at King's College London, as well as the director and head of the Strategic Studies Program at Observer Research Foundation, ORF, a think tank based out of New Delhi. He is also the director of Delhi School of Transnational Affairs at Delhi University. Dr. Gudrun Backer is a senior fellow in the Asia Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. Her research focuses on Chinese foreign and security policy, EU-China relations, China and the Asia-Pacific region. She is also EU delegate at the Experts and Eminent Persons Group of the ASEAN Regional Forum. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today, Dr. Pan and Dr. Gudrun Wacker. Uh, Professor Pan, I would like to begin with you. Uh, a very basic, but some, a question which summarizes uh, the whole debate. What is the essence of Indo-Pacific as a geopolitical framework? What is this Indo-Pacific? And does it have any implication for regional or global security? Why, at the first place, we felt that there is a need to move away from the already established Asia-Pacific towards this new concept called Indo-Pacific? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yathard, and thank you, uh, you know, to the Manipal Center for European Studies for having me uh, as part of this program, uh, and I uh, look forward uh, to our conversation today. Uh, with Dr. Wacker as well, uh, and, and all of you. I, uh, you know, essentially, uh, geopolitics, we are, we, we are talking about these days, you know, the emerging ge geopolitics, new geopolitics, and geopolitics uh, might be new, but, you know, the idea of the Indo-Pacific is actually not so new. If you, if you go back, uh, at least as far as India, India has been concerned, uh, because India has been at this at this unique position between you know Indian Ocean and uh, you know straddling Indian Ocean in some ways and Pacific Ocean, uh, and uh, it has always looked at this vast periphery engaging both to its east and to its west uh, as as one maritime zone. It you know often because uh, it also puts India in a difficult or in a straight jacket if you just say that look India is an Indian Ocean power and this has been the traditional thinking. Uh, that yes, we have we have geographical advantages in the Indian Ocean, um, but largely what it reduced India to was uh, a, a, an Indian Ocean power, a South Asian power, uh, and and if you look at the mental mapping that that emerged during the Cold War, there was this sense, especially uh, I think uh, emerging uh, in the West, in in the, in the US in particular, the way their commands were divided, this idea that somehow South Asia was not integral to this idea of Asia. You know, we used to talk of Asia, Asia Pacific, and South Asia. 
you go back to this terminology again and again in policy documents and academic literature asia as if india is not part of asia as if india has not has not contributed anything to asian landscape as if the interactions between uh, a, a south asia and the mainland what was called as mainland asia asia pacific um, uh, you know had not taken place but we all know uh, our historical linkages have shaped uh, you know our southern uh, empires had, had long contributed engaged with uh, through the maritime domain across asia pacific so i think this this artificial distinction that emerged especially during the cold war uh, uh, isolated india in some ways in the in the geopolitical imagining of the region now uh, you know all all the geo, uh, you know uh, geographies um, are by nature uh, we tend to think of geography as as a constant variable but actually geography is also emerged you know they are constructed deconstructed imagined reimagined uh, we think of our own geography differently we think of our own neighborhood differently uh, you, you look at what we are doing with, with the focus on bimstek uh, uh, focus on bay of bengal suddenly we are talking of myanmar and thailand as our immediate periphery uh, whereas the south asia context was slightly different uh, uh, you know uh, uh, suddenly uh, after 2001 afghanistan became part of south asia whereas traditionally we had thought of south you know afghanistan uh, as as part of central asia now so i think geographies also have a have a you know the, the way uh, you think about geographies the way you deconstruct and construct these geographies they have real time implications and some of the implications for example uh, in the context of indo pacific are quite evident that the moment you start looking at indian ocean and pacific ocean as a as a contiguous maritime zone uh, you you start looking at the regional balance of power differently you start looking at the regional issues differently and you start uh, you know uh, in, from from new delhi's vantage point you start looking at india's engagement in the indo pacific differently and, and i think that that so so there have been multiple you know uh, aspects to this conversation over the last few over the last i would say two decades and in particular i think uh, uh, one should not forget that the most important reason we are discussing indo pacific today is because of the rise of china you know the rise of china has allowed us and has forced us to reckon with the changing landscape of global reality both in the indo pacific as well as in eurasia i think both of these geographies are being remapped reframed reshaped by china in significant ways and if it were not for china's rise we would not be having this conversation but along with china's rise i think what is important is that other nations have tried to respond to that rise in a certain way Uh, and i think india japan australia and now increasingly europe and america are looking at uh, this geography through a, through a different lens giving rise to this uh, to this indo pacific logic of its own uh, so by and large i think uh, uh, you know uh, if you if you see uh, what what the rise of china did the kind of pressures it put the countries in and you go back to this essential question of uh, the you know in in recent times the first articulation was by uh, japanese prime minister shinzo abe when he talked of the confluence of the two seas right so the, so he was responding to a certain challenge that japan has been facing from the changing balance of power in the region and 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 these concerns today that have been accelerated in recent years you know rise of china america's inward orientation what is europe doing about it those those uh, i think were were foreshadowed in some ways Uh, by japan much earlier because japan is a, is in a particularly vulnerable position and therefore his articulation that unless you look at this indian ocean and pacific ocean as one contiguous maritime zone you would not be able to respond strategically to to this environment was a very important i think landmark in the way it pushed countries to think a new about their regional priorities but look it it took from from his speech um uh, you know from shinzo abe's speech uh, on the conference of the two seas to uh, i think particularly this year uh, particularly 2021 when i think uh, it seems to be an inflection point in the way global realities have shaped up and global um, acknowledgement of indo pacific in some fundamental ways uh, from the west has come 2021 was the year when we saw european union articulating an indo pacific strategy 2021 was the year when you have individual european countries talking about indo pacific uh, like you know germany netherlands uh, and of course uh, we had seen 
to uh, leaders level summit uh, uh, of the quad itself uh, in, in 2021. So I think uh, we have traversed that entire distance partly because uh, you know we the, the balance of power has been undergoing a dramatic transformation partly because uh, the the middle powers in the region be it australia japan india pushing their own uh, you know uh, priorities uh, further and then partly because uh, america and the west started recognizing the need to be involved in this region through a different lens and not uh, through through the traditional asia pacific and south asia lens so i think that transformation seems to me uh, to have been uh, completed in 2021. The question is, uh, what do we do from here onwards, which I think was something that you will talk about later. Jathath, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pant. Uh, I'll, uh, Dr. Wacker, I'll move to you now. Uh, there are many misperceptions and criticisms with regard to the Indo-Pacific concept. The way Dr. Pan said that 2021 was the year uh, where this concept actually uh, took a very concrete shape and actually uh, 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 gained a, a, a very rapid speed, uh, the thinking uh, at which it, 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 it materialized. Uh, so somewhere the speed at which this thinking has taken off uh, may be one of the reasons uh, that the viability of the concept remains still uh, quite questioned. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Pant has said that the concept itself is not new and uh, it is basically uh, it's taking place, uh, it's replacing the artificial, previously artificial construct of Asia Pacific, but that is also one of the criticisms, uh, especially with, which we hear from China, that Indo-Pacific is also an artificial construct, basically to contain China. And as Dr. Pan said, the rise of China is one of the major factors behind uh, the rise of Indo-Pacific also. So my question is, how do we deal with this criticism? Do you see any valid argument behind this criticism when we say that it is an artificial construct to contain China? It is just another Western imposed notion. Is it even a Western imposed notion or uh, is it a very uh, regionally evolved concept within Asia? Uh, also here, I would like to know if it's not just to contain China, do we consider China as a viable Indo-Pacific power? Over to you, Dr. Bakker. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, I'm sorry if my voice is not really up to uh, speed here because it's very early in the morning and I haven't talked a lot yet. So <clears throat> I'll try my best. Um, let me start by by saying that I fully agree with Harsh that you know all these concepts are constructed. The Asia Pacific was a construct. The Indo Pacific is a construct, but it makes a lot of sense. And I would, as a European, uh, the starting point for most countries would be an economic one, uh, and the economic argument that you know there are all these this trade is going through the Indo Pacific. So basically, there are economic facts. I also want to uh, compliment what uh, Harsh said. Um, I mean, the moment the East Asia Summit uh, had the first summit and included India, and this is an argument that Rory Metcalf has made, South Asia and India was somehow seen as part of the region. Maybe not the other countries of South Asia, but India was in. And already in this case, Japan played a major role to bring India in because China would have preferred ASEAN plus three, but other countries argued ASEAN plus six. So India was in from the beginning. And I think there already you have the fact that this is seen as one space. Um, second point I want to make, we still have very different geographical understandings of what the Indo-Pacific is. Uh, for the US, basically, it has to do with their military commands. Uh, they usually say it's from Hollywood to Bollywood. 
Um, for France, the starting point is their overseas territories in the region. So for, from their perspective, it's the east coast of Africa, spanning all the way to the South Pacific Islands, and basically covering the overseas territories that uh, France is the only EU member state now that has territories in this region. So for them, it's very natural to look at this as one space. Um, so each country has a, a slightly different understanding. For example, the Netherlands uh, basically says it starts from Pakistan and from there it goes east. Um, and if you, <clears throat> the Germans sort of avoid to, <laughs> to uh, make a, a geographical definition, but if you look at the maps, it more or less uh, overlaps with what uh, the Netherlands have come up with. And the EU sort of supports this interpretation of France. So this alone shows that it's a construct, you know, and countries have different reasons why say, they support a, a specific um, yeah, definition and understanding of the Indo-Pacific. Let me also say that uh, from a European standpoint, um, containment of China is not the issue. They would never say they try to contain China, nor would any European member state uh, say that. Um, because simply because we don't think that it will be possible to contain China in any way uh, meaningful. So the uh, approach of the Europeans is an inclusive one that also considers China as a part of the Indo-Pacific. Of course, I agree, without the rise of China, we wouldn't talk about these issues. But um, for the Europeans, it's still a matter of an inclusive approach, and I would even argue, I mean, the French came out with their Indo-Pacific concept, uh, I think in 2018, they became serious about it. <clears throat> when uh, Macron traveled to Australia and gave a speech, etc., there were several documents, but there were no takers in the European Union. There was not a lot of support because of the very specific starting point of France. And it was, I would say, really the fact that ASEAN, uh, the, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, finally embraced the concept by putting out its own outlook on the Indo-Pacific that made it more digestible from the European perspective. Because before ASEAN published the outlook on the Indo-Pacific, it was basically the quad that embraced it. And this was too anti-China uh, from the European perspective. So when ASEAN came out with the outlook, Germany and the Netherlands that had already agreed with France that you know they would go forward with pushing this agenda at the European level, they became really serious about looking at it. So it's not, um, of course, China plays a huge role but there I, I just say that um, Europeans are divided. They have agreed on this formula that China is a partner in some areas, a competitor in a lot of areas and a systemic rival that is pursuing a different idea of global governance and uh, order than we do. <clears throat> but the, the relative weight of these three dimensions, partner, competitor, and rival, this is seen differently in each country. And, uh, you know, we just had a change in government in, in Germany, so maybe now the balance is a little more leaning towards the systemic rival and less the partner uh, dimension of, of this complicated relationship. Um, yeah, I also want to mention that, uh, and this is important because you already heard uh, the official version of the EU yesterday that uh, this whole Indo-Pacific uh, process in the European Union was a very unusual one because it was a bottom-up initiative by France and then 
you know, germ supported by Germany and the Netherlands, and they found the support of other countries like Sweden and Poland. And then, so you have a reverse process, so to speak, in the, in the European Union, which is kind of unusual. You have the council conclusions first. This is what the member states decide, the foreign ministers of the member states. And then they task the European institutions with coming up with a joint communication. And uh, from my experience, if I look at other documents of the European Union, this was a very, very fast process. So the European Union was really ready to take it up. The problem now will be how to follow through, how to make this sustainable, and will we come up with the resources, the human resources and the financial resources to really do something. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Pant, uh, what Dr. Wackel is saying uh, is that containment uh, is of China is not really an issue uh, for the European Union. That's not how uh, the bloc looks uh, towards, uh, at least, uh, you know, it does not look towards in the Pacific through that lens, through that prism. Uh, I have two questions here for you. One, uh, we have to confront the independent prism, that is China. Uh, how does it view this whole idea of Indo-Pacific China? We often hear that uh, China is reimagining history in the Indo-Pacific. So it's important to understand what are Beijing's national interests that are at stake within Indo-Pacific. And I ask this question because to understand anything that is happening at present geopolitically, it is very critical to understand what China seeks and why it seeks. Uh, also related to that question and what uh, Dr. Wacker has said, uh, the way uh, EU looks at uh, this whole Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, not through a prism of containing uh, anti-China rhetoric, they don't want to bring it up much. Uh, do you think somewhere it kind of aligns more with the ASEAN outlook? Over to you, sir. See, even um, uh, even for example, Quad, uh, if you if or even India's position, uh, Mr. Modi's speech at Shangri La uh, is about inclusiveness. The fact that you imagine uh, this region as an open and inclusive space. Now the question is that we can. You know, that is something that we can say, but whether China accepts that logic is another matter, right? So I, I agree. Containing China, I mean, I think, you know, a power like China that, that is rising tremendously and has is now, in, uh, you know, embedded in almost all our, all our nations. That containment, a traditional containment policy, uh, I don't think uh, is sustainable. And that is, I think, recognized by every country. So what... Or, or all major powers. Now the question is, how do you approach this through a different lens? What what can you do uh, to make sure that you are challenging China where it needs to be challenged? Now that the, the one way of doing that is to create an alternative framework, right? You you provide alternatives to regional states. Now one of the problems has been that uh, in, in the region has been that ASEAN, for example, or other smaller states find that the only alternative they have, whether it is infrastructure financing, whether it is trade, whether it is economic uh, engagement, uh, largely China looms large. Now, if there is no alternative or there is no alternative framework, that there are no alternatives available, then I think the question is that it becomes a one-way street. So, uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the Quad document, for example, Quad statements, Quad um, uh, approach to this, uh, I think the idea is to provide an alternative, even, even European Union, what is, it, what is it trying to say? It's saying that, look, uh, we, we are going to focus on economics, we are going to focus on infrastructure and connectivity, and that's something that we, we, Europe does well, so why not offer this as an alternative? Uh, to the to the to the regional states uh, and and that way they will have greater leverage over their own decision making and uh, they will have greater autonomy over their decision making they they can't be coerced and bullied by countries and in particular china because because i think that is what we have we are we are the way uh, china is weaponizing trade the way it is weaponizing uh, you know uh, aid the way it is weaponizing connectivity i think the challenges for smaller states are growing 
So uh, by and large, I think for uh, countries, including India, uh, the question is not whether you are with 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 Indo-Pacific or even with other uh, you know platforms you can contain China. I think the question is, uh, what do you do with the emerging reality where China is is becoming too powerful, is so powerful that it can dictate terms of engagement to countries, and what do you do to ensure that there is some semblance of a balance in the region? Now, one way of doing that is to form like-minded partnerships. Uh, with countries that look at the region, regional issues through the same lens as you do. And I think if you, if you, uh, in an ideal world, of course, when you, when Indian prime minister says that, look, uh, we want to, uh, we are interested in an inclusive and open regional order, which means that theoretically, even China is welcome to join it. But the fact that China will not join it, or the fact that China has, uh, does not view Indo-Pacific as an idea that suits its interests. That's another matter. That's a matter for China's, China to decide. But what has happened, I think, and that is, that is a point that I think is interesting and is not often made, that if you look at the idea of the Indo-Pacific and how much investment for the, uh, over the last few years China has made in trying to discredit this, uh, you know, Chinese foreign minister is on record to say that this is an idea that will dissipate like a sea of foam. Now, how much investment China has made in dissuading other countries, in coercing and pushing this agenda on the regional stage, the fact that China has today lost that, uh, you know, ideational uh, battle, the fact that ASEAN even, see, ASEAN is a very divided organization, but despite that, they came out with an outlook on the Indo-Pacific. I think that's that says something about the way uh, regional uh, sentiments are evolving. That uh, at the end of the day, China has lost that battle where it wanted to discredit Indo-Pacific, where it wanted to, uh, you know, uh, make it, uh, put it in the ash heap of history. The fact that Indo-Pacific is now being embraced from the West to the East is a testament that the regional realities have evolved far beyond what China wanted. So I, I, you know, I, and that's a, that's an important point because uh, China, in a in a way, uh, this was an important contestation, the first contestation on the Indo-Pacific, the very idea, the very nomenclature of the region, and Chinese argued that this is not something that they accept, but the fact that every other country is accepting it or most other countries have accepted it uh, is, is a sign of our, of our times. What is interesting is that if you see Indo-Pacific, especially in the last year. Uh, if you see uh, Chinese reaction, it has actually been quite muted on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in fact, Russian reaction to the Indo-Pacific has been more strident. The Russians have often on public platforms denounced Indo-Pacific throughout last year, the way Chinese did not do. Chinese are more subtle now. They know that you know ASEAN has an Indo-Pacific outlook. They really can't go and go and dictate to ASEAN don't have a regional uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific. They can't really dictate to EU. Uh, that don't, uh, you know, don't come up with an, uh, 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 you know, with, with a document on the Indo-Pacific, with a vision on the Indo-Pacific. So, uh, Chinese have become, uh, you know, Chinese have, in, in a way, are embracing that logic. Now, the question, I think, for those, as I think uh, uh, Dr. Wacker pointed out, the question now is for those who have, who have uh, won this first stage of ideational contest, is what do we do from here? How do we operationalize some of these ideas into reality? How do we make sure that these alternatives that we are proposing stand on their feet, that they are credible, that they are acceptable to the to the uh, to the uh, re, uh, to the regional players, and that they have a uh, you know they have a solid um, uh, legs to stand on, that they have resources. That if if you are talking of uh, connectivity and infrastructure. You are investing where it is needed. You are giving the regional states alternatives. You are bringing them on board. So I think the question now is uh, is not that Indo-Pacific uh, uh, is, is being contested. Yes, I mean, it, it is being contested and China will always contest it. But the fact that everyone else has embraced it seems to me uh, to be the end of the first stage of contestation. I think that now the second stage of contestation begins where the ideas that we have put forward on the table, what do we do with them? We have won the ideational part, but where there is the operational part now. Can we put enough resources on the table? Can we put enough uh, commitments on the table? Can we have enough? Uh, can we have a leadership that is committed to these ideas over a long term? Uh, just as the Chinese are committed to their BRI, 
uh, do we have uh, you know um, washington and brussels that are committed to their own build back better initiative or global gateway initiative or major you know other initiatives that are there in the, in the making so i think that is the, that is in, in essentially an operational context it's no longer an ideational one and there uh, uh, i think working with like minded countries working with countries like european union uh, working with partners like european union for for india that's a normal choice that's a natural choice uh, because that's the only alternative we have even if you know india's ability to sustain itself as a as a regional player you know in, in a sense as a, as a global player with that can work with like minded countries is is something that we want to uh, invest in and whether india is investing in in third countries i think that is something that uh, with in partnership with with you know with with, uh, with stakeholders like the us or eu that is something that i think we need to uh, think about more categorically but i but i i don't think china's displeasure at this stage uh, is is that important now i think just very briefly the, the point that you had raised about what does china want i mean in an ideal world china would certainly would would have wanted would want uh, a region where uh, it remains the dominant player right economically militarily strategically uh, and I, i don't think there is any doubt about it uh, but in some ways the what what has been interesting in the last two years in particular is the push back that that china has received it both in the region and beyond now one aspect of that is uh, you know is uh, is uh, what we are talking about in the pacific but there are other aspects as well uh, i mean <clears throat> just to to put it in a context like quad uh, you know uh, in in 2000 in 2007 when we when we started off on the quad uh, indians and the australians decided and uh, that we don't want to go down this road because this is too risky it will antagonize the chinese by 2017 we were back to square one we had started talking about quad again and by 2021 quad uh, was so potent that you had two leaders level summit in a matter of months in a in a year you had two leaders level summits in 2021 so the trajectory i think uh, has been shaped by chinese own behavior had chinese been more subtle Uh, i i think they could have nipped quad in the bud in 20 uh, in 2007 itself when australians and the indians decided that it is not worth the risk that the costs are too high but the fact that from 2007 to 2017 chinese were even more belligerent chinese were even more aggressive chinese were even pushing back harder against australians and the indians it resulted in a complete shift of mood in in canberra and new delhi so i think there are there are some aspects here which the where the pushback is 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 beginning to shape up in terms of the platforms in terms of the institutional and nomenclature that we have been discussing and in terms of providing alternatives to the region and that is something that i think uh, uh, it has been uh, it seems to me uh, that it it perhaps the diplomatic cards that china was playing were not as uh, you know as subtle or as effective as china would have wanted uh, and and therefore There, there are some aspects where the costs have begun to rise for china now whether they rise enough for china to uh, you know to be part of this inclusive uh, 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 you know regional uh, architecture uh, that is something that we we'll, we will have to wait and watch oh, can i can i just say one one tiny thing uh, because i looked at the chinese literature on the indo pacific there are academic articles um and it started in 2008 17 18 you find more articles on the indo pacific and the thing is that at that time um most of the academics argue if we want to weaken the quad we need just to improve our relationship with india and with australia and what did they do they did exactly the government or the party did the opposite right of what the all the academics agree if you want to weaken the quad improve the relationship with the two weakest links in the quad so to speak no big hope with japan no hope with the us but australia and india are not on the same uh, page exactly um but they didn't do it and i think one of the problems um and this comes back to uh, yata you 
the question you asked, what does China want? I think they see the world more and more only through the lens of the US-China rivalry. And every other piece falls into a slot on this, you know, matrix of US and China. So you're either for the US and then you're against China. And this is how they also assess Indian and Australian behavior. It's not, they don't recognize anymore that uh, smaller countries and middle powers have their own national interests that they have to care about. They just see it through the lens of where does it fall in the rivalry between the US and China. And that's a huge problem because they ignore the national interests of, of smaller countries, of middle powers. And the same applies to the European Union. Whatever we do, if we talk about strategic autonomy, the Chinese say, yeah, go for it because they believe it will weaken the transatlantic relationship with the US, between EU and the US. But if we do something with together coordinated with the United States, you know, like sanctions or anything, then of course we fall into the category of ganging up against China. And this is a problem for all countries other than the United States, I believe. So I, I just wanted to throw this in that there are academics in China who had the right recipe if you want to counter this, this back, uh, pushing back against China, but they will not listen to. And I'm really starting to wonder who Xi Jinping listens to. This is something we are all wondering about, you know, what kind of information does it even make up to Xi Jinping? What informs his worldview? What China wants basically is not achievable. It's absolute security domestically and internationally. That's what they want. And I think that's not gonna happen. Sorry that I jumped in here, but I thought it's important to see that there is a nuanced uh, picture within China, but the party and Xi Jinping, they decided to go down this road to, you know, to basically have a multiple front confrontation with, with basically all the neighbors. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, points which are coming up through this discussion. Uh, in any case, the emerging power contest in the Indo-Pacific has many dimensions in there. It has military strength for one. It also has economics of wealth, trade, investment, infrastructure, technology offers a new commanding heights. Uh, diplomacy and intelligence play their part. Uh, but so do propaganda and political interference. And uh, narrative uh, has been the battle. Uh, what Dr. Pan has said that this battle of narratives is kind of lost by China. We are already moving away from this uh, ideational uh, you know, contestation to the oper operationalization part. Uh, what uh, what Dr. Wacker is uh, here is saying is uh, that somewhere this you know coming back of sovereignty and uh, strategic autonomy it it somewhere it 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 plays in favor of China because it, in the long run it's going to weaken transatlantic partnership. Uh, another important uh, thing which uh, both the panelists have said that uh, uh, with regard to Chinese behavior. Uh, they could have uh, uh, nipped in the bud the whole idea of the Pacific and Quad if they were maybe a little more moderate towards. Uh, a question uh, uh, I, I asked both of you. Uh, that somewhere, uh, Dr. Michael has said that China has, you know, look, look at this whole idea through the prism of US-China rivalry. Dr. Pan is saying that, you know, it wants to create its, its uh, it wants to achieve a hegemonic status. But uh, I want to uh, bring in the point that, uh, do you agree that uh, Chinese leadership somewhere has linked its own credibility and legitimacy with advancing China's interests across the wider region? Uh, you know, alone, uh, if we see on great powers, it, it is China's Indo-Pacific strategy 
somewhere uh, which connects directly uh, uh, to the survival of the domestic political system and the vested interest of the leadership. Uh, it's it's to both both the panelists. Uh, do you agree with this uh, this uh, this reading of the uh, China, China's uh, aims and ambition? Over to you, Dr. Pant. Maybe you can go first. See, I think um, all authoritarian states, and especially the kind that, that uh, China is becoming now under Xi Jinping, it seems to me that uh, they have to link, uh, uh, you know, their uh, domestic, their, their domestic standing, the domestic uh, 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 sort of uh, positioning of uh, Xi Jinping as a leader is certainly linked to uh, the perception that he can create as a strong leader that you know that uh, that doesn't take no for an answer that that will push back even harder uh, that will uh, you know who will stand up uh, to a, to an array of forces uh, ranged against him uh, and i think as he moves towards even greater consolidation centralization and of course this year is very important 2022 uh, when he will be formally um, crowned uh, as the emperor of China. Uh, I think uh, there is certainly this link between what, what uh, uh, you know, how he is looking at the domestic environment and his standing there with what he can possibly uh, achieve in the, in the international realm and any perception of weakness uh, will be seen as a uh, you know as, as uh, uh, you know uh, will will go in the debit ledger debit part of the ledger. So certainly uh, uh, for any you know the kind of centralization that we have seen is unprecedented you know uh, in the in the last few years. He's now he's now openly saying that look uh, and at least his party and his followers are openly saying that he is second only to Mao in the in the in the hierarchy in the rankings. His thoughts are being studied extensively, so he's uh, he's almost uh, uh, you know uh, the the great uh, great leader uh, with some very distinct characteristics of his own. Uh, so when you are when you have the sense of uh, of your own uh, you know uh, legacy and your own uh, role in the historical evolution of China, uh, I think uh, we need to take him seriously. That uh, you know that he will push back hard uh, and and. Uh, and, and we we know that this you know this is happening. Look at look at the Taiwan situation, right? Mm -hmm. Look at Hong Kong. What he has done with Hong Kong, I think a, a lot of this uh, is also something that uh, perhaps in the early stages when Xi Jinping was just beginning to gradually evolve or come into its own, perhaps if the world had pushed back slightly hard harder, uh, we would have uh, you know we would have had a bit more of a balanced response because then he would have realized. That, uh, there, there are certain things, uh, you know, there, there are certain areas that should not be um, engaged with or, or should be, uh, you know, uh, should be engaged with differently. But I think that was a, that, that was something where, where I think the international community did miss a bus, because if you look at the South China Sea dispute, uh, how, uh, you know, uh, those artificial islands came up and how there was a lack of response uh, from the West, uh, from uh, the neighbors. Uh, and and that that resulted uh, in a certain degree of confidence that that I think the regime has gained that they can push back. Now, of course, there is a there is a broader pushback against China, and uh, and and maybe maybe uh, she uh, and his and his coterie will recalibrate. But it's very unlikely, particularly this year, I think, uh, because of, be, of this year being so important uh, in 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 his uh, in the iconography of of, of Xi Jinping. And that we will see any um, uh, you know step back, uh, and and so we see right. We we are we are seeing that there is a, there is a persistent bombast. Uh, there is a persistent uh, campaign against Taiwan. There is a persistent uh, muscle flexing on along the LAC with India. There is persistent muscle flexing with with regard to East China Sea. So I I think th these are the areas which are which are clearly linked with his domestic standing. And, and what Dr. Wacker was saying earlier, I think this the sense that, look, uh, we, uh, China uh, and, and Xi Jinping, in some ways, uh, sensible people uh, in, in the party uh, or in the government would have told them that, look, uh, you really uh, shouldn't be making everyone an enemy. 
but the point that if you think that you are the destined ruler of china who is to take china to the to, to its manifest destiny then i think those those things really don't matter those calculations change and in some ways i think that is happening with with the with the with xi jinping and 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 what he's trying to do and what he's trying to accomplish and the question is whether the pushback against china that we are witnessing will change his calculations uh, i very much doubt in the short term that is going to happen uh, because it it needs to be a sustained campaign a sustained effort by the international community by like minded countries uh, again as i said sustained operationalization of these ideas because often what we also see uh, in uh, you know from a chinese perspective what we see is that look uh, we are sustained if if you are xi jinping uh, then sitting there you would you would argue that look i am sustained i am continuously putting the pressure everywhere that i can whereas the rest of the world especially the major actors they sometimes come in and sometimes they disappear they are not they are not uh, you know the, 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 there is no sustenance in their in their uh, uh, in their campaign against me so why should i bother so i think there is there is also an element of what the international community what like minded countries can do together uh, and and achieve certain certain results certain real time results whether by providing uh, alternative world views whether by providing alternative frameworks whether by uh, you know bringing in um alter, bring, giving alternatives to smaller countries that can be operationalized i think those are the real time things that that need to be done if this calculus of of china uh, is to change but because it is so so directly linked with uh, with the she's own personal ambitions and his own idea of of chinese reju rejuvenation uh, i very much doubt that in the short term we are going to see any uh, any toning down of both the rhetoric as well as the actions uh, dr vaskar um, let me start with the question of legitimacy because i think um i have thought a lot about that i mean i used to say that while in democratic system systems legitimacy comes from the input side it's the the elections you elect a leadership and you know the legitimacy comes from this election um in a country like china and in a system like china the legitimacy comes from the output but the question is legitimacy in the eyes of whom for example one of the biggest achievements of jiang zemin was to co-opt the middle class the new middle class in china um to the to the agenda of the communist party not by allowing them to participate i mean in the west we had this theory that the upcoming middle class you know they enjoy economic uh, prosperity and then they will ask for political participation and this will lead to a, a change very simply put and it it was not the case in china why because they very cleverly co-opted the middle class not by giving them the right of participation but by consulting them from time to time on you know new laws and stuff like that now we are in a phase where um the xi jinping legitimacy coming from his anti corruption uh, fight in the very beginning when he took over the leadership in china this was a very very popular campaign anti corruption and he could basically kill three birds with one stone so to speak um now we are in a different phase because now he's addressing the income gap the sort of um you know celebrities who have a lifestyle that is not compatible with um with the the ideals of the communist party or something so it's a different sort of legitimacy from the perspective of a different uh, part of the population which has been left behind despite all the you know sort of promise for everybody will be better off tomorrow uh, in tomorrow's china so legitimacy is a question of in whose eyes legitimacy um and this brings me to the lost battle of narratives although i agree that um in in many countries china has lost this battle there is a majority of countries that would still 
go with China and I only want to point to the UN system. And this was also made possible by the, the withdrawal of the US and of Donald Trump from many of the UN sub organizations like UNESCO, like the Human Rights Council. Everywhere where the US moved out, the China moved in. And if you look how China is introducing new language, for example, into the universal human rights you know, formulation, we can see that China is gradually changing the, these concepts by introducing their own language. So I'm not so sure that the battle of narratives is won because it's the same tactic they used in the South China Sea that Hash has pointed out, you know. You do a little bit, you go two steps forward, you go one step back. If there is a pushback, then you go another two steps forward. And this sort of salami slicing that took place in the South China Sea is also part of the um, tactic we see vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, where we have this constant pressure, the disinformation and all that, but everything is below the threshold of provoking a huge counteraction. So it's this, it's this sort of chipping away, you know, chipping away on uh, agreed formulations at the UN level, chipping away on the, well, I don't, can't say sovereignty, the de facto sovereignty of Taiwan. And I think the South China Sea should be a warning to us or a lesson to us that after a while China has established facts, facts that cannot be rolled back anymore. And that's also taking place at the global level in the global governance institutions that China is gradually changing the the rules of the game, so to speak. So I'm not convinced, you know, whether they win the battle of narratives or not. I sometimes think it's pretty crude what they put out in terms of, of propaganda movies about uh, the coronavirus, et cetera. And you really wonder who is this addressed to? But look at the vast majority of countries and how they behave at the UN level um, when, when there is a vote. And you will see that there is a lot of support. I mean, Germany stands up and speaks for 43 countries and then Pakistan stands up and talks for 123 against, you know? And this is, this is the fact. So it's the same with the legitimacy. I mean, yes, in many countries, the population, China is not very popular. They might have lost the narrative, but um, that doesn't mean we have won it back because we are also under assault in our own systems. I mean, in Europe, we have these illiberal democracies, um, you know, that are populist countries. And this is the appeal that China has and Xi Jinping has as a strongman. It's countries that also have strong leaders who aspire to, you know, build the country in their own image. And it's, it's the surveillance technologies and it's stuff like that where China makes the headway. So I, I just want to point out that it's, it's more complicated than you have a battle of narratives and one side wins um, because there are a lot of factors playing a role. Um, and I, I think yesterday the EU uh, official talked about the arrogance of the Europeans. We still see the world in East-West terms. We never see the North-South dimension. But this is something that China has been exploiting very cleverly and where I don't see that, that India brings the same pound on the table, so to speak, the same weight on the table, you know? I mean, China is rolling out this, this is the narrative they're rolling out in these countries that 
um, they used to say we are not a model for anybody. Now they say this is how you an alternative way to developing your country. It's the infrastructure and, you know, it's connectivity and it's all of that. And China is already there and they're providing solutions that are better tailored for developing countries uh, that don't have a very advanced banking system or whatever than our companies do. I mean, look at Southeast Asia. You can go to the airport in Kuala Lumpur and, and pay with Alipay for your noodle soup there. I don't see that any Western companies or Indian companies have come up with, with this sort of solutions. And we have to become better in that, in providing the alternatives that Harsh was talking about, but without completely losing our standards and, and entering a race to the bottom with China because we will lose this. We will lose a race to the bottom. We can only succeed if we stick to certain standards of sustainability, uh, you know, environmental labor, et cetera, et cetera, to provide a better alternative. And that unfortunately takes time. So look at the European connectivity strategy, which existed for three years and nothing happened. So if we don't do better with the global gateway, I feel we're losing out on that as well. Uh, thank you so much, Ma'am. Sorry, uh, long speech. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Uh, one last question very briefly to Dr. Pant before we move to our uh, question and answer session with our participants. Uh, Sir, uh, Dr. Backer has said that, uh, and even you agree that it is a very sustained campaign and you know sustained operationalization of ideas and uh, projects which we require to actually uh, 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 achieve a headway uh, with China on, in this region. And uh, Dr. Becker also po pointed out that India is not uh, pulling up its weight in this direction. Uh, if we see India has adopted the concept of Indo-Pacific with, uh, with a very rapid speed, uh, but uh, also its, its policy obviously towards the Indo-Pacific is a subset of its China policy. But there are contradicting elements within India's Indo-Pacific approach and its approach towards China uh, at one level. Uh, it is building partnerships, uh, you know, uh, with various countries. And at another level, somewhere it is kind of reassuring China also. So what uh, uh, our Indian academician, uh, it's, uh, Dr. Rajesh Rajgopalan has uh, termed it as evasive balancing. Uh, I would like to know your assessment uh, of India's approach towards Indo-Pacific as a whole and uh, towards China in particular and this whole idea of evasive balancing. Uh, what do you think of it? Over to you, sir. See, India's, um, uh, I mean, in, I, I don't think India in some ways has a choice when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, both India's own ambitions to play a larger role uh, in, um, in Asia, as well as uh, I think this, uh, this demand from the region that the regional balance of power is moving in a certain direction and it needs India uh, to be an integral part of it means that, you know, both demand a certain kind of India's in Indian role in the region. Now, India has a problem in the sense that uh, a uh, the economic might of India is not uh, sufficient uh, to carve out an autonomous role for itself. I mean, and I, and, I, and I think that goes for other powers as well, because if, you, know, you really can't compete with China on a dollar to dollar basis, whether it is aid, whether it is trade, whether it is infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and I think uh, the problem that India has, uh, all, which, which is, I think, some ways, um, which resembles the larger problem in the region is that, uh, China, you know, China is a neighbor with whom we share one of our la longest boundaries and that boundary dispute remains unsettled. And we also know that uh, we are 
a decade, if not more behind China in terms of our capabilities. So the question is, how do you balance, uh, how, you know, how do you balance uh, a power like China when it, you know, when you have a situation like this? And, and to my understanding, uh, evasive balancing uh, or perhaps is the only option. Because if someone were to tell Indian decision makers that let's, you know, uh, uh, let's decouple from China economically. Is it, is it feasible, especially in the, in the COVID context? Is it desirable given uh, the economic uh, catastrophe that it would uh, unleash on, on, our, uh, on, on the livelihoods of, of ordinary Indians? So what, what I think has happened and, and where I think uh, India has to take a lot of blame uh, in terms of uh, China policy is that for the last several decades, we have been sleeping at the wheel. See, it is not, we often, we often argue that, look, China is doing this, China is doing that, and China should, but China is doing what you would expect any major power or, you know, or a kind of power that China is to do in, in India's vicinity. China will intrude into, uh, into South Asia. Why not? You know, it's not as if we are living in 17th century where you have a sphere, although it looks increasingly like we still have spheres of influences uh, uh, around, but certainly, I mean, it's not as if India can say to its neighbors, don't trade with China, uh, don't engage with China, uh, you know, don't, don't take money from China. Uh, if, if, if there is money available, if resources are available, uh, these are uh, Indian neighbors are free to use ch China to their advantage. The fact that India has not responded to some of their needs or that India has not been efficient enough in responding to some of those challenges is, is India's problem. So, uh, you know, we often, uh, uh, there are innumerable examples of how uh, ineffective Indian decision making at times has led to a number of problems in India's vicinity. Take, for example, Hamban Tota port with Sri Lanka. We often talk of Hamban Tota, oh, Chinese have taken away Hamban Tota, Chinese, have, Chinese are building the string of balls around us. But Hamban Tota was first offered to India. Some, uh, some bureaucrat in, in the Ministry of External Affairs who was not even uh, at the level of undersecretary wrote a note saying that we do not have uh, a few million dollars uh, to, uh, was led to this problem. That we, we did not finance that project and ultimately Chinese financed it and then they sat on it and then they became a 99 year old lease on, uh, on that. So, I mean, I think at times we see again, infrastructure, right? Border, border infrastructure. What prevented India from building its own border infrastructure? Who was pre preventing India from doing that? No one. It was, it was our border, our money, our resources. Our, so our decision makers are at fault. For the last several decades, we have been sleeping. Now, suddenly now when China is all over us, we are crying, you know, uh, for what, what is this? China is doing this, China is doing that. So I think all India should take the blame uh, as I think the West, West should take the blame uh, of, of not responding to the China, of not looking at the Chinese economic question. Uh, you know, how is it that the balance between the West and China became so skewed? Economic balance. How is it that the, that the Chinese, that the Ameri American companies have to tow the Chinese line when they go to, uh, go to, uh, go to China, China mainland and to, to do business? But there is no reciprocity. So I think this, this entire question of bringing China into the global fold that, uh, that uh, at, at, at one point, uh, uh, you know, Western policymakers propagated will make China like them, which I think Dr. Wacker was pointing out that they will become suddenly like uh, democracies, liberal democracies. It, you know, it was a big fallacy for, uh, in, in some ways. And, and when, it, when it started going wrong, no one, no one was protesting. People were just, uh, you know, it, it was easy money. Everyone was busy making easy money. Everyone was very happy making easy money. And we are all very happy. We thought that this was going to last forever. So I think that the challenge at times is that we have not responded to the policy issues that China had been presenting now for quite a while. These policy issues have not come to us, you know, in, in a jiffy. They have been with us for, for a long time. The fact that we did not respond to those challenges adequately has led us to this problem today where, uh, uh, you know, uh, China's rise has suddenly confronted us with, a, uh, with certain choices that we are not willing to make. Now, what I think in India's case, thankfully, 
uh, and hopefully has happened with the with the Galwan Valley incident is that some somewhere down the line we have woken up to the challenge or woken up to the reality that the border with China is not going to be stable any longer. You know, because again, this was a this was a fantastic assumption that we lived in. Often you would hear Indian, and these are serious Indian policymakers, and some of these policymakers who now parade around as China experts in India, they told us that look, LOC is a problem, LAC is never going to be a problem. We have such great ties with China. We are civilizational partners. We are Asian countries. We will never, uh, you know, Chinese are never going to use force against us. These these borders are going to be always. We will manage them. We will manage them diplomatically. We will continue to talk about uh, border talks. So these are not even border talks. These are talks about border talks. And we have been having these for decades now. So we were happy with that status quo. Now suddenly that status quo changed because Chinese had the initiative. They changed the status quo uh, on, on, uh, in, in 2020. And when they, I think thankfully post that, uh, there is a sense that look, status quo cannot continue. And we have changed our policy in, in a sense that now we are arguing that unless border issue is resolved, uh, it's very unlikely that we will be able to move on other areas with China. So there, there, you know, there are some tough decisions being made, uh, like, for example, the Quad, uh, like even, even the fact that Malabar exercises, for example. India would not invite Australia for Malabar exercises because some, somewhere down the line, we thought this, was, uh, this would annoy the Chinese. But look, we are not inviting the Australians for decades, did not actually... Uh, make Chinese happy in any case. So uh, I think uh, there is a shift post uh, post 2020, uh, and we are not. We have taken certain decisions, certain clarities there. Uh, uh, you know whether it is 5G issue, whether it is uh, Chinese investments in critical infrastructure areas. We are becoming more cautious about where Chinese money is being poured in. But as I said. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there are times when people, people say, why are we trading with China? I don't think, uh, you know, uh, the complete collapse or complete uh, disengagement from China on the economic uh, matters uh, makes any sense. Uh, China is a global economic player. We will have to deal with China. We will have to engage with China. The question is, uh, are we changing the terms of that engagement? Are we cognizant of the costs of that engagement? And if we are, then what are we doing to shape it, to, ch to challenge it? Somewhere we have started making some progress, uh, but economic dimension is going to take long. I mean, you know, sometimes people look at the figures and they say, look, this year China, India has traded more with China than, than previous year. Uh, you know, and, and there is a complaint about it. But I think that the reality is that, uh, that, that if, even if you want to restructure trade with China, this is a year's long effort. This is not going to happen in a year or two. So hopefully, you know, hopefully that, that recognition that, uh, that uh, you know, our supply chains are too over-dependent on China, our economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, architectures are, are too cognizant of, uh, are too, um, are being shaped by China's rise in significant manner, that we do not have any leverage. That recognition has come. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and I think how far we take that, whether we now start pushing the button on, on, on issues like Tibet and Taiwan and others, that remains to be seen still. But I think there, perhaps uh, the, the diplomatic engagement with China that we still continue, for example, even today, I think there are talks between the uh, border, border commanders uh, 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 at the LAC, uh, Indian, Indian in China. I think the, ultimately the idea is that, look, you really cannot... Uh, take on China frontally. You have to, you can only do two things. You can build partnerships. You can hope that those partnerships are able to provide regional stability and you can build domestic capabilities. You can reduce your dependence on China in critical areas. Those are the things you can do. Uh, and I think those are the things that New Delhi seems to be making an effort uh, at last, whether they succeed, whether they work, uh, that is again in the realm of speculation at the moment. But I think India's China policy uh, has always been a bundle of contradictions. And my own sense is that given our, uh, given the fact that we are a neighbor, that we have to tread a very, very cautious line, given our capability differentials, we'll ensure that some, some amount of 
uh, you know, back and forth, some amount of engagement and competition and that will continue. In any, in any case, we live in an era where most countries are opting for, uh, uh, you know, what, what are called as um, uh, promiscuous alignments. You know, we, are, we want to uh, engage and we want to compete at the same time. So I think there is a sense of promiscuity everywhere. And, uh, and I think India is part of that uh, broader uh, engagement, whether it is squad, whether it is, I mean, we are still part of BRICS. Uh, we are still, we still do Russia, India, China trilateral. Uh, Russia is a very important partner for India. And I think a lot of this has to do with how uh, India engages with Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, how Russia's relations with the West evolve, uh, which do not look very promising at the moment. So I, I think multiple, uh, you know, uh, there are multiple balls in the air. Uh, so juggling all of them uh, is difficult for, for most countries. But I think in particular for India, which faces a really a frontal challenge now with China. And I think uh, that makes this, uh, this an inflection point in India-China relations. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, with this, we open the floor for question and answer. Uh, participants, you can post your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand and mute yourself and speak. Uh, we have to close the session at 1.30. Please be brief, very brief. Yeah, I can see Anand and Bhavri. Uh, Anand, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. I hope I'm audible. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, sir uh, and madam, thank you for the highly intuitive, highly uh, informative lectures and your opinions that you've provided so far. Um, for, with regards to Russia, how do you see Russia's, you know, political relations with both India and China and go forbid this happens but in case there's an you know escalation between India and China how do you think Russia would you know most likely intervene given that you know we ourselves have had a good history with Russia but China also does have it and even though China Russia would try its level best not to let something of that sort happen or uh, you know, something of that level escalate, but still, if we had to choose between India and China, what would it do? Please address who are you asking this question? Uh, yeah, okay. I'd like uh, to, uh, her sir to answer this. Uh, thanks, Anand. Uh, you know, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, a question that many Indian policymakers <laughs> Uh, worry about but uh, but my own sense is that look uh, uh, Dr. Wacker made an interesting point about China looking at uh, uh, you know all engagements and all relationships to the prism of US China um, contestation and I think in some ways that also applies to Russia because Russia is increasingly also its, its entire foreign policy prism is about its antagonism with the West uh, and and how you know Russia is planning to uh, under Putin is trying to come back as a global player and how there are constraints being put by by the Western nations uh, and and that I think is a prism that has brought Russia and China so incredibly close uh, you know even a few years back you would often hear this discussion about Russia and China that look they are coming close they have to work closely but it's not a strategic partnership. Uh, you know they are. Um, uh, you know there are too many differences between them. There is Far East, there is Central Asia, there is this and that. But I think what we have witnessed uh, is, is 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 a certain acceleration in their relationship and, uh, and and a really strong strategic partnership emerging. That I, I don't think that should be doubted uh, for their own reasons. Both of them have their own reasons, and and I think it's 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 incredibly clear. What is also clear, I think, especially what we have seen. Um, uh, so, so just on this point, uh, uh, you know, as, as I was mentioning, if you if you saw how vociferous Russia has been on the Indo-Pacific on Quad, uh, how acerbic its reactions have been, it's quite uh, quite interesting to just watch that. But I think what is also clear is that Russia still wants to retain uh, that space where it. Uh, where it does not want to be seen as a junior partner of, of, of China. Uh, 
So this has been an interesting development in the Indian context. I think if you see, um, uh, of course, India was worried. And if you, if you recall, the first visit of, uh, of uh, Indian defense minister was to uh, Russia once the crisis escalated along the LAC because there was there was there was worry when what what would you do if, if Russia's uh, Russia on whom you depend for more than 60 percent of your defense supplies if they just switch off the tap uh, so I think uh, but clearly what we have seen is is uh, an acceleration in Indo-US in Indo-Russian relationship um, both uh, on account of especially in the last few months on account of Afghanistan we have seen that uh, on account of uh, the, the, the regional environment, we have seen that and India has been very keen to preserve that space for itself um, uh, because it, it certainly views Russia as a very, very important player in its own foreign policy calculus. Uh, and, and Russia has indicated that it is willing to, uh, you know, for example, this, uh, uh, that it, it, it has continued to sell and uh, defense supplies to India. Uh, there, there were reports that at times even Chinese requested Russia to go slow on that, but Russians decided not to do that. There are some differences emerging on Central Asia, for example, uh, as far as uh, post-Afghanistan situation is concerned um, between Russia and China. But uh, so, so I think there is some space there which India has. And India has often argued with its Western friends that, look, um, uh, it is important to break this relationship between Russia and China. From a, from a strategic perspective, if you think about the, the rationale of, of Russia and China coming together and how uh, a potent a strategic challenge they pose together, uh, and you go back to Cold War and Kissinger era um, assessment of breaking the Chinese away from the Soviet camp, thereby uh, winning the Cold War in some ways. Uh, I think that is a strategic uh, argument that India has been having with, the, with some of its uh, uh, Western friends, but that has uh, clearly between what is happening between West and, and Russia is, has been escalating. Uh, and we know, you know, Ukraine is there, Kazakhstan now. Uh, so there are multiple fronts on, on this, uh, uh, in, in, this uh, in this engagement. But for India, I think uh, the, the sense that you get is that uh, Russia has for the moment uh, taken a, a position which is uh, divergent from its China policy that it, it is willing to give India that that space in its foreign policy matrix uh, that despite its observing the the relationship uh, through the anti-Western prism, it is not in, uh, willing to abandon India. And similarly, India, despite its very strong relations with the U.S. and with the West, is not uh, is not being willing to cede Russia to uh, to China. So I think that element give some continuity to Indo-Russian relationship at a time when Russia-China relations are actually growing very fast. Uh, thank you. So there are quite a few hands uh, which I've raised. Uh, we can take a few a few questions together maybe and then uh, let's see. Uh, Gauri, Hitesh, Anirban and Rishabh in that order. Please be very brief. Um, uh, hello, sir. Uh, my question is to Dr. Harsh. Uh, so how do you see India's foreign policy with regard to neighborhood first that uh, it, it initially came up with? And how do you see that? Um, how do you perceive that particular policy? Do you see that it is uh, given that a lot of our uh, neighbors uh, but st have started siding with uh, uh, China, for example, like you mentioned, uh, Sri Lanka and, and also Nepal in a brief period initially, then uh, how do you really actually see this policy? Uh, what is your analysis on it? Thank you. Hitesh? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so my question is to Dr. Wecker. Uh, uh, how exactly uh, China's uh, anti-imperialist stance uh, play a role in formation of uh, uh, you know, sentiments of uh, middle class in Europe uh, for, for uh, so, yeah. Uh, Richard, maybe? Hello, uh, my question is directed towards uh, Dr. Wacker. Um, in your uh, uh, address, you briefly mentioned the phrase of, we will lose the race to the bottom. Uh, if you could please elaborate on the bottom part of it and how it's, uh, yeah, thank you. 
So we can take these questions and if we have time, let's see uh, which I doubt we will have. Uh, maybe Dr. Khan, uh, you can go first on India's neighborhood. Okay, but very briefly, uh, Gauri, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, this is a question that is certainly for India very, very crucial. You know, what uh, neighborhood is crucial and, and, and India's role in the neighborhood and India's partnerships and engagements in the neighborhood. Uh, the way I see it is that uh, uh, India's neighborhood, uh, of course, has is being reshaped by China's presence. There is no denying about it. What there are there are two elements to what has happened in South Asia and, and in the wider Indian Ocean region. One is, uh, in the past, we used to talk of India-Pakistan binary. Now we talk of India-China binary. I think that the whole debate on India-Pakistan is now done and dusted. We don't need to, uh, you know, I think uh, it, it is now for history books. Pakistan's economy is smaller than the economy of a city of Mumbai. And I don't think we need to take, uh, so Pakistan remains a problem as far as nuisance value is concerned, terrorism is concerned. But I, I think the real contest in South Asia is now China, uh, China's uh, involvement, China's uh, engagement, China's large economic and uh, and. Uh, uh, broader presence, political presence in the region. Now, you know, once, once you look at this China, uh, India binary as the key binary, what do, does it mean for India? It means that, look, some back and forth between India and China will continue, that you have these small countries in the region that have their own agency. Often media portrays this, uh, especially, in, uh, you know, in media in India portrays this as something that uh, India and China can decide on their own, you know, uh, whether India should invest this in, in, in Nepal, whether India, China should, uh, China should do this in, in Sri Lanka. But this is, I think, more than India and China, it is the agency of smaller states in the, in the neighborhood that is now defining this, this uh, na neighborhood problem for India. Because those neighbors now know that they have two major economic players nearby, they can use them. Uh, they can, uh, as all, uh, you know, uh, small powers would do uh, to their advantage, they can leverage one vis-a-vis -vis the other. And that's what they have been doing. Uh, you know, when India did not finance Hamban Tota and Sri Lankans went to Chinese and said, come, come to China. And, the, and now when they went, uh, when their debt has become too high for, for Sri Lankans, Sri Lankans are coming to India and saying, help us with financing. So I think that is something that, that will continue to happen. And uh, my only argument here is that the contestation has become sharper. Uh, that India is willing to now push back against uh, or, or willing to stand up at times, uh, which we have not seen in the past. Uh, in, the, in the past, uh, there had been issues uh, with, with, you know, with regard to, uh, you know, what uh, uh, India perhaps can and cannot do. I think those issues are now getting, uh, are getting resolved. Uh, India is, India is looking at the challenge uh, that China presents to the region, to India, and India is willing to say that, look, uh, with all our resource uh, constraints, we are going to push back against this to an extent we can. So I think we are seeing a lot of that contestation emerging in, in, in India's neighborhood, and this is going to be a permanent feature now. I, you know, this is not going to go away. So, you know, you, you, you hear these headlines often in the, in the media, this project won by China, China is winning. Uh, this project in, in Maldives has been won by India. India is, India is winning or India is losing. I think that's a, you know, that's a superficial way of looking at it because by and large, this contest is for the long haul. This contest is what, what smaller states are willing to do. And this contest uh, and this contestation between India and China is going to be a more or less permanent feature of our neighborhood. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vakar, there are two questions for you. Would you like to address? Yes, I start with the race to the bottom because that's the easier one. Um, what I was talking about is a race to the bottom, meaning label standards, environmental standards, and the feasibility of projects. These are, you know, three criteria where um, Europeans, but also the US with the blue dots initiative, et cetera, there are certain standards you don't want to lose uh, uh, out of your sight. Um, so where a race to the bottom means, where would we stop with a race to the bottom? Would it be child labor? And I'm exaggerating a little bit here, 
but it's really, you know, working conditions for the people involved in the project. Then uh, when it comes to the environment and a country wants a coal, coal based uh, power plant, would we go for that um, sort of against our own uh, fighting climate change agenda? Um, and also the feasibility of projects like, does every country really need a high speed train or do they just need a train that works? And we have to assess this first. What does the country really uh, want? So that's what I mean by race to the bottom because the Chinese have been doing everything in the past, even building white elephants uh, projects in, in some Africans uh, states that made no sense at all in terms of connectivity or, or infrastructure. So we should not enter a competition with China on, you know, losing our own standards that we would apply in our own countries. The second question, I'm not quite sure whether I got it. It was about China's anti-imperialist uh, stance. Um, first of all, I think this is an argument that the Chinese regularly uh, instrumentalize um, if it's feasible, but um, you don't see that UK-China relations, for example, were influenced very much by the opium war or something like that. It's a more general argument that the Chinese bring forward to explain uh, some of their behavior um, and it, for me, it falls under the, you know, convenient instrumentalization of, of an argument. But uh, there is uh, an aspect to this, and I think the Europeans have to be very careful because the cannon boat diplomacy argument has been raised by other countries in the region as well. Um, when it comes to uh, European military presence in the region. And there have been some warning voices, for example, from Australia, that the UK should tread very carefully when it, uh, you know, it engages uh, with a military presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And also, I think we should be very careful about NATO um, getting more involved in the region. NATO could probably, if the countries want that, um, for example, in the cyber realm, there could be some more cooperation. But in terms of military presence, I think it's not only China that can reawaken this, you know, argument of is this a real living or a, a revival of, of the imperial uh, behavior of the past. So we should tread very carefully and be aware of that. Um, that's also one of the problems I, I have with the, with the French, um, you know, attitude uh, in a way, uh, because, I mean, Germany had colonies and lost them all because of our stupid world wars. Um, but we have to be sensible about that. And there is still a lot to do in Europe um, to, to grapple with our own history uh, in terms of our colonial past. And this is true for basically all European countries who had colonies either in this part or you part of the world or in Africa or somewhere else. So I think we should be sensitive um, and do our homework at home. Uh, just one last question, maybe. Uh, Anirban, would you like to go ahead? Thanks a lot uh, for, uh, uh, for, for giving me the floor. Uh, so my question that was basically a uh, signal to uh, Dr. Pant. Uh, so with regard to that, uh, since we can see uh, the how China is reacting uh, these days or, or, the, or, the, or we tag it as, as wolf for a diplomacy. So uh, do you think that, uh, that China's uh, century of humiliation or the historicity behind uh, uh, these actions, uh, whether China is conducting these activities on the basis of its uh, historical or, its, or the basis of its troubled past? So 
See, um, I don't know whether, uh, you know, whether wolf warrior diplomacy uh, can be attributed to China's troubled past, but certainly some, uh, you know, uh, some aspects, I mean, history conditions, uh, all nations, history conditions, uh, the behavior of all nations on the foreign stage uh, and the external stage, and China is no exception. Uh, but I think uh, uh, one also uh, has to see whether it is being used more instrumentally uh, now than in the past. You know, every uh, uh, if if this is about the humiliation that China has faced, why is it that most countries at the today that are at the wrong end of China are smaller countries, are weaker countries? If, you know, one you know one can expect China to to you know to stand up to the West, uh, for example, at times and, and make this argument. But uh, more often than not, today we are finding that it is the smaller countries, the weaker countries that China is pushing back against uh, in the in, in their periphery. So I think at times, uh, while history conditions are behavior or nations' behavior, it is also that uh, we, nations use it more instrumentally. You know that uh, this is to justify their behavior with everything. That China is doing can't be attributed to uh, to what their historical uh, precedents were or to what their historical problems were. Uh, but yes, uh, I think there is a certain amount of uh, you know if you if you read the literature on Chinese behavior uh, on on Chinese foreign policy and Chinese uh, approach to the wider world, there is a sense that historical role, uh, the, the historical conditions have played in conditioning uh, the thinking, uh, just like other countries uh, also have that, that same uh, you know, issue. I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wacker was pointing out about Europe and how their approach to, uh, to certain questions is colored by their engagement with, with their colonial history. Similarly, I think India's approach is colored by India's own um, British colonial history in, 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 the, in the past. Uh, so, uh, so we should not expect China to be any different. But I think uh, the question is whether uh, that is being used uh, relatively instrumentally and selectively or whether it is something that is that is of a genuine a feeder in their approach to the wider world. At, at, you know, at the moment when China is uh, clearly the dominant economic player in the world, uh, to use this uh, argument to sustain some of the most egregious um, land grabs, territorial grabs it is undertaking, I think uh, defies logic. To me. Uh, we have almost reached uh, at the end of our session. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our two esteemed guests, uh, Dr. Pant and Dr. Wacker. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your valuable inputs and uh, time with us. It was truly a pleasure to uh, engage with you on this uh, topical issue. Uh, and we would love to have you again uh, with us at uh, Manipal Center for European Studies. Uh, a, a, a small announcement for our winter school participants. Uh, we will gather again at 2 p.m. IST after a very short break uh, for the second session. Please join in uh, 10 minutes prior to the scheduled time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>